I invite you to turn your uh, hymnals to page 83 in the back, the Belgic Confession, number 29, having to do with the marks of the church. It's a hefty article, so I think I'm going to go ahead and read it. You can follow along in your hymnals as we read of the marks of the true church, wherein it differs from the false church. And uh, in our day and age, uh, that should be plural, false churches. (laughs) This continues to be a distinction. We believe that we ought diligently and circumspectly to discern from the word of God, which is the true church, since all sects which are in the world assume to themselves the name of the church. But we speak not here of hypocrites who are mixed in the church with the good, yet are not of the church, though externally of it. But we say that the body and communion of the true church must be distinguished from all sects They call themselves the church. The marks by which the true church is known are these. If the pure doctrine of the gospel is preached therein, if it maintains the pure administration of the sacraments as instituted by Christ, if church discipline is exercised in punishing of sin. In short, if all things are managed according to the pure word of God, all things contrary thereto rejected, And Jesus Christ acknowledged as the only head of the church. Hereby, the true church may certainly be known, from which no man has a right to separate himself. With respect to those who are members of the church, they may be known by the marks of Christians, namely by faith. And when having received Jesus Christ, the only Savior, they avoid sin, follow after righteousness, love the true God and their neighbor, neither turn aside to the right or left and crucify the flesh with the works thereof. But this is not to be understood as if there did not remain in them great infirmities, but they fight against them through the Spirit all the days of their life, continually taking their refuge in the blood, death, passion, and obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ in whom they have remission of sins through faith in him. As for the false church, it describes more power and authority to itself and its ordinances than to the word of God and will not submit itself to the yoke of Christ. Neither does it administer the sacraments as appointed by Christ in his word, but adds to and takes from them as it thinks proper. It relies more upon men than upon Christ and persecutes those who live wholly according to the word of God and rebuke it for its errors, covetousness, and idolatry. These two churches are easily known and distinguished from each other. There you go. You have here clearly identified for us the three marks of the church. Now let's look at uh, three passages, uh, one for each of these marks. And truly, 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 Uh, We could do a sermon in each mark, but we're just going to do one sermon on the three marks uh, of the church. So it'll it'll be a little sketchy, but at least we'll be able to identify the marks and see the biblical base for them. Uh, The first one is 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, the mark of the pure preaching of the word of God. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions or their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths 
As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Having to do with the sacrament, pick 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. <clears throat> and then lastly, um, the third mark of the church, second one being sacraments, Third mark being discipline. Matthew 18, 15 through 18. If your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how we do pray that your spirit would illumine us, that we would not be without understanding, but have true discernment, and the marks of your church, your true church in this world, and be able to support it, whether it be here or elsewhere, and be able to speak encouragingly of it. But also, Lord, with such discernment, be able to distinguish, Lord, that which is not a church, though it may claim to be so. Grant us, Lord, this holy discernment that we might walk in your light, that we might be able to fellowship not only with Christ, but with his people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now we have learned already that the word church means an assembly, whether it be in the Old Testament Hebrew kahal or the New Testament Greek uh, ecclesia means the assembly of the people. It's an assembly for worship. That is the church. It is the covenant community for worship that constitutes it. We find the covenant community in the Bible, in the Old Covenant, and in the New Covenant, both. And we find that those covenant communities are created and defined and in covenant with God by way of the Word of God. So the Word of God is distinctly a covenantal word. It's a word addressed to uh, his people, binding them to him uh, under uh, sanctions for blessing or for cursing. Well, these covenant communities, particularly the church and the new, uh, should be identified. We should be able to identify it when we see it. And the Belgian Confession, of course, uh, makes differentiation, doesn't it? Between two churches, that which is in conformity to the defining marks of the church and that which is not. And so we should know what those marks are, those identifying features. And we have them not only in the Belgic, but we have them in the Word of God as well. That we might know the true church. And the first mark of the true church and the premier mark of the true church is the pure preaching of the gospel or the faithful preaching of the word of God and it's the word of God that gives birth to the universe uh, the Lord spoke and it came to be and so we find in 2 Corinthians 4 uh, that as God said let there be light and there was light so the Apostle Paul says God 
in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ has spoken new creation light into our souls, the light of the glory of the gospel of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, that word, according to Peter chapter 1, which we saw last week, is the instrument through which the new birth is brought about and we become a new uh, creation. Uh, and thus we learn of the priority uh, of the word of God. And this is its first mark in, in the life of the covenant community. It is God's word. God's word is in the context of its larger meeting. It's there for worship. So the reading and preaching of the word of God uh, is not something that worship uh, as it is mounts up to or leads us to. But worship is part and parcel. I mean, preaching of the word and reading of the word is part and parcel of worship itself. It is an act of worship to read, to preach, to listen, and to believe the word of God. It is an act of worship. It is a premier act of worship. Remember Psalm 95. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Then it says, if you hear his word, what? Don't harden your heart. But the word of God is not a neutral word. It's a word that demands response and consequently has an effect on the outcome in your own heart to either harden or soften it accordingly. So the preaching of the word is premier. In the worship of the church. It was premier on Sinai. Uh, anytime you ask anybody, well, what happened to Sinai? People immediately say, Ten Commandments. But why did they uh, ask Pharaoh to let him go? To go get the Ten Commandments? No. They said, let us go worship. That was an act of worship on Mount Sinai. God meeting with his people, and that meeting involved the word of God that bound the covenant people to their covenant God. And so in Luke 24, when Jesus, the day he's raised from the dead, the first day of the week, what happens? He meets those two guys walking the Emmaus Road, and he opens up the scriptures about himself. He preaches the word as the word is focused in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he came to do. And then afterwards, what happened is they went and they broke bread together. On the first day of the week, we have the word and then followed with the breaking of bread together. Uh, the new covenant community is formed in Jesus Christ on the first day of the week. Luke 24, Acts chapter 2, first day of the week. And then later on in Acts 20 verse 7, Paul says they went to meet together on the first day of the week in order to to break bread. Worship on the first day. And that worship is a worship with the word. As Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. It was the word he preached and proclaimed. And then what did they do? Just like on Sinai. What shall we do? On Sinai they said all the Lord has spoken. We will do. Now they were condemned. <laughs> they crucified the Lord of glory. What shall we do? And Peter tells them uh, to repent. And to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And 3,000 souls on that day were added as they responded to the word of God. The faithful preaching of the word. The word is premier in the worship of the covenant community. And therefore, since the word is so important... And since the word can be manipulated by the devil and men, it's important that those who preach the word are properly prepared for preaching the word. That they're able by way of gifts to preach the word. And they're able by way of skill in understanding and explaining and expounding this word Truly, and thus, it is only right that men are trained in the word. And we should resist with all our hearts some idea that 
The spirit so overwhelms a man that he does not need to be rightly trained in the ministry of the word of God. Such charismatic fantasies should be wholly resisted and, and counted for what they are. It's very profane and demonic meanderings about the nature of and the sobriety of the Christian ministry and its preparation. And not only should a man prepare rightly, but the Apostle Paul himself says that the ministry of the word is so important in the life of the church that 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, those who preach the word should make their living by the word. Paul connects the ministry of the word as its significance to the ministry of the priesthood in the Old Testament, where the priest was supported in his ministries by the people. And so Paul says in the New Covenant, just as the priest was supported by the tabernacle, the preacher of the gospel should be supported. Why? Why why do that? So he can sit around and goof off six days of the week and then one day a week put in an appearance and chatter away and impress people with how charismatic and informed he is about the world and Stuff, God things, no way. If he's rightly to preach the word, means he needs to prepare, he needs to study. What's the number one reason you pay your pastor? The number one reason you pay your pastor so he can study and preach the word and give you the goods, not rip you off every week. Some type of spiritual chicken soup for the soul skims lightly over the surface of scripture. You walk away feeling good about yourself rather than being filled with the word and spirit of Christ. There's a big difference between the two. The man should be rightly trained, rightly examined, and rightly supported by the people for the benefit of their own souls. And that is the earmark of the church. And Paul, when he handed the ministerial baton off to Timothy, told him that he should fulfill his ministry and preach the word. And earlier in that same epistle, Paul told Timothy that he should study and not be ashamed. And hopefully you connect together chapter 2 to study, chapter 4 to preach. He studies well so he can preach well to God's people. And uh, God forbid that you say of your preacher, he's funny. I hope he's of good cheer. I hope what you say about your preacher, he gives me the goods. He gives me the gospel. Gives me Christ through the word. I might trust in him. And forget about the preacher, because I'm too preoccupied with Jesus. To preoccupy with Jesus during the week. And therefore, preachers should be easily replaceable. One preacher gets too old, you need another one. Shake his hand, give him his gold watch, get another one. You don't worry about it. You don't stay attached to that prior preacher. Oh, we loved him so much. He was this, he was that. Forget about it. It's just an instrument, just a vessel. If he's anything worth being a preacher, he's glad to think himself as nothing more than that. A mere vessel. It was privileged to serve Christ for a while, a while in your midst. True shepherds, true preachers of the word, preach sound doctrine. They preach the gospel. They give people something to think about. They give something for their minds. First and foremost, and hopefully for their hearts to dig into, so they lay hold of Christ. That's faithful preaching. The old statement in the book says of John Wesley, said he rode into town and he gave them Christ. Don't you like that? I don't like the fact he was an Arminian, frankly. But I like that. He rode into town and he gave them Christ. There's some people that put inside those big pulpits 
There's little rails up there. And, it, and in the, when the pastor gets up to the pulpit, he can read inside the pulpit. He says, Sir, we would see Jesus. Wow. What do you want to see? You should see Christ. But you should see Christ in a distinctive way. Christ in the Bible is by way of law, gospel, and law. You have the law that convicts you of your sin and brings you to the gospel of Christ. The indicative in which you are declared righteous in Christ. Which you are declared liberated from the curse to walk anew in the power of the Spirit. That's gospel. And now you have the law back again that will not beat you up, cannot curse you, but will be a guide to your life. And the very first commandment you delight in, thou shalt have no other God before me. Why would I want anything other than Jesus before me? Why any offering of this world would it gather my attention and rivet my attention and gratify my desires more than Christ? People come to church and they say, I'm bored. Church is boring. It's boring to be there. What's the problem? Well, the pastor should ask himself, maybe I am boring. On the other hand, if he's preaching the word of God, and you're bored hearing God's word, you've got a problem. You're deader than a doornail spiritually. And they have no desire, hunger, thirst for good food. I set before you a delicious medium rare steak, or however you like it. On the left hand and on the right hand, I give you a bowl of imitation corn, that candy corn that you give out during Halloween. Okay, take your pick. What do you want? You want the boring steak, or do you want that exciting candy corn? <laughs> Come on. If you have no taste for that steak, you've got a problem. Get with it. It's good stuff. You've got no taste and hunger for the gospel of Christ. The pastor's up there to give you Christ, to tell you there's forgiveness in Christ, there's renewal in Christ, there's comfort for your soul in Christ. You can go out and face all the difficulties of life no matter what they are because you're plugged in to the eternal kingdom in Christ. If you go out and you die this week, that's fine. You're with Christ. You're better. It's over for you. You've run your race. That's good stuff. You come on board with that. The church is boring. <laughs> You're in trouble, man. That's all I can say. You better repent. And just because people say, Bible, 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 I believe the Bible, and we believe the Bible, and we're a New Testament church, and blah, 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 blah. You've probably all heard it before. It doesn't mean squat. What does the Bible teach? What does it say? What does it mean? What is its message? How do you understand what the Bible is saying? That's the critical question. Don't try to beat me in submission with an abstraction. In the biblical picture is law from the Father, gospel achieved in Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God rewriting a love for God upon your heart. Sovereign grace. And that's the center feature of good gospel preaching. Though it may be accomplished and done in a lot of different ways. But this is what feeds the people of God. This is how the church is built up, not broken up. And secondly, the second mark of the church is the proper administration of the sacrament. And that all the sacraments should always follow the word. The word is first. The word was first on Mount Sinai. The word was first 
On the day of Pentecost, the word was first when Jesus rose from the dead. Sacraments follow. They're the signs and seals of the covenant of grace. They're visible boundary markers of the covenant community. You can identify the covenant community in this world because there's visible boundary markers. Baptism says you, you've been received into the covenant community. The Lord's Supper means you're being continually edified, fed, and nourished within the covenant community. And both of those signs are signs of God's forgiveness in Christ. Both of them. One initiatory and the other one to sustain you in the journey, one to begin the journey, one to sustain you in the journey. One is, 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 is in most cases given to the immature, it's given to a child. And the child then is to grow by doing what? By drinking in the pure milk of the word, like a baby. He's to be given baby milk, physically, and spiritual milk of the word so that they can grow up and arrive at the point of spiritual growth where they can come to a conscientious point of decision. Yes, I want to express my allegiance to Jesus and my love for his church by professing my faith and sitting down and communing with Christ in his meal. The full cuisine, the Lord's Supper. Those sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace physically marking out the people of God. Baptism is a passive rite. It's done to you. The Lord's Supper is an active rite. You do it. Do this in remembrance of me. You participate. It's an active rite of communing with the one who has laid hold of you in your baptism. And so a true church will celebrate these sacraments in a proper manner. And if those sacraments are not celebrated, you don't have the true church there. You don't, you don't have visible, visibly identifiable. That's what it does. It visibly identifies. If you don't have those, then where is the church? They mark the boundaries of the covenant community from infancy on up to maturity. And uh, you cannot take any away, or should you add to them? Like the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. And the sacraments must be instituted by Christ as sacraments, otherwise they are not sacraments. And there are only two that meet that qualification. But the sacraments, insofar that they mark the boundaries, the physical boundaries of the Christian church, the question should come to our mind, well, well who determines whether that person should receive that sacrament or not. The person has come up and says, hey, would you please baptize me? Hey, I'd like to partake of the Lord's Supper. And you're there, oh, okay, okay, sure, fine. I mean, is it the person that wants it is the one who determines whether it's appropriate for them to be baptized or to partake of the Lord's Supper in that visible covenant community? In other words, who is the one who admits people in? Or even as we saw in 1 Corinthians 5, say that they should be removed from the covenant community. And that's where we come to church discipline, which we read about in Matthew chapter 18. If a person is unrepentant about their sin, it's not that a person committed a sin, that's not... That's not grounds for excommunication. It's on repentance for their sin. It's grounds for excommunication. But it says those that you bind will be bound. Those that you loose will be loosed. This is rabbinical language preceding the New Testament itself. 
And Jesus said, I give, Peter spoke to Peter in Matthew 16, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. To bind on earth will be bound in heaven. To loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Guard a church discipline, but you bind on earth will be bound on earth. What you are bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a correspondence, Jesus said, with regard to the keys and the exercise of them in the visible church on earth. It's just not a, a disconnect. Oh, that church, they kicked me out, but you know, I still have my Jesus. All is well. Probably not. If any church has the pizzazz, in this day and age, you actually discipline somebody. They probably have rightly put teeth in it for a good reason. Now, I'm not denying that some churches use wrong reasons. I'm not denying that. But what I'm denying is the idea is there's some disconnect between heaven and earth with regard to the church's discipline. We must consider and give due weight to the words of our Lord that when the eldership of a church exercises the keys of the kingdom with due diligence according to the word of God, what is done on earth is done in heaven, Jesus said. You know, as a walk away, oh, that church, they're a bunch of idiots. No, you're an idiot. You are risking your eternal soul instead of listening. to God's church, God's shepherds, with regard to the issues in your life that need to be addressed. The discipline of the Christian church has fallen on hard times. It's always been a difficult issue. For those in the John Calvin reading group, you will find that John Calvin got in a lot of trouble because he wanted to rightly exercise church discipline in the Genevan church. He got a lot of trouble over it. It's not popular. But it's biblical, isn't it? Read it, Matthew 18, Matthew 16. The elders of the church are to protect the church's well-being. Not any doctrine can be brought in by anybody uh, any behavior under the sun is not permitted. There are things that are appropriate and fitting and suitable to the body of Christ, and there's other things that are not. Thus, when you become a member of this church or any good reformed church, and you say your membership vows, one of the things that will be contained in that membership vow, and you can read it in the back of the hymnal here, but it'll be something along this line that I submit to the government of this church, and should I be found delinquent in either doctrine, that is, the things I believe, or life, I will heed its discipline. I won't harden my heart. Say they're just a bunch of overbearing men. I'll give due consideration. And carefully attend to the instruction, to the challenge. Why is that? Why does Jesus implement church discipline? Well, it's a mark of the church. What, what, what happens if there's no discipline? Well, you got all kinds of teachings. Anything's acceptable. Except for maybe the, maybe the pastor sets himself up and says, I'm the one. I will determine what is biblical and what isn't. You, you're in. You, you're out. You know. Oh, the, 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 the church should have a, a, a coherent, clear statement, confessionally, as we do here, praise God, and as the Reformed churches have always had. People knew where they stood. Can I believe in some type of modalism? There's only one God that appears as Father, sometimes appears as Jesus, sometimes appears as the Spirit. And that's what I believe. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. That's a denial of the Trinity. That's modalism. That's Sabellianism. That's oneness Pentecostalism. That's not historic Orthodox Christian faith. Is that okay to believe that here and be a member in good standing? 
No. But we can help you reevaluate re the scriptures if you're willing to look at the scriptures. Consider the word of God. And for we would wish to incorporate you into the full grace of God and the triune, uh, the triune God. So you can join us and sing holy, holy, holy. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The discipline of the church is absolutely necessary for its integrity, both in terms of its belief and in terms of its behavior. Three marks of the church are indicators of what a church is. And the sharper that these marks are along biblical lines, the sharper these marks are along biblical lines, the sharper and brighter will be the church's testimony to the world, its benefit to its members, its blessing to its members and the glory of God. We live in a day in which these time-honored biblical principles are being thrown overboard. Thrown overboard by a church that is proverbial mutiny on the bounty. When you throw those overboard, you're spelling doom for the church. It will. It, it is on its way to being mutated into a synagogue of Satan. It is on its way to hear the words of Jesus Christ threatening his own visible church with removing the candlestick from them. We must lay these things solemnly to heart as the people of God and embrace them as the marks of the church. Marks of the church that Jesus Christ said he had come to build. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he will build it through his life, his death, his resurrection, the outpoured spirit, and accompanied with the ministry of his word, sacraments, and discipline. That's how Christ will build his church. As his church feeds upon the faithful ministry of the word, as his church feeds upon the blessed sacraments that bring home to them, comforts their souls in the grace of God, and his church heeds the caring words of the discipline of the under shepherds. As God adds to their number, day by day, those will be saved. With those marks in mind, so we can look forward to Jesus Christ dwelling with us. Dwelling with us. Identifying with us. Nurturing us and using us. And to the day he comes back in power and glory. The Apostle Paul says that we will be gathered to the Lord when he comes back in power and glory. We'll be gathered to the Lord as the body of Christ up in heaven. The very words of gathering that's used with the gathering of the church on earth in Hebrews chapter 10. We will be gathered, but not horizontal. It'll be the final gathering vertically. We'll be forever with the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father.